It can't start again. It'll be okay. I'm not going. You have to, Sandra. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We are at episode 63 this time around, which is Erica's choice. Let's find out what Erica has in store. I have chosen Two Days, One Night, or Deux Jours, Une Nuit, from 2014, written and directed by Jean-Pierre and Luc Dardin, with Marianne Cotillard and Fabrizio Rongione. You only chose this one so you could break out the French, didn't you? No, no, no. How do you say <laughs> no? Were you instead expecting me to choose six days, seven nights, or seven days, six nights, whatever it is? 40 days, 40 nights? Either one. One of your all-time favorites, 30 right? days of night, any of those? I'd watch 30 days of night. I know, you, you are a big fan of that. Well, after the thrill ride and chuckle fest that was Wanda, <laughs> I thought I would follow it up with something equally as lighthearted. November has been a heavy month, as it turns out, right? As we move towards the end of the year, this gets a little bit lighter. It has been a heavy couple of months for me. We've got a lot of difficult world events happening. <laughs> you don't say. And then October turned out to be, I think, a little bit more difficult on me than I initially thought it was going to be. Just because of the workload we impose on ourselves for that? That, plus some of the selections. Some of them ended up kind of hitting close to home. Okay. And instead of making a 180 and really choosing something that might really have lightened the mood, I kept going with, let's just keep hammering on this. And all kidding aside, though, this film is deeply personal to me. I feel very connected to it. It's a difficult world to live in while I'm watching it, but it really speaks to me. It's interesting that you fix on this one so much, and it'll make complete sense once we have this discussion and everybody gets to hear that. But once again, I'm also kind of mad that you beat me to one of my favorites. I think I was the bigger Dardan fan before we got to this one. Because you introduced me to them. But I think that all of my experience with them all together doesn't add up to how much this one means to you. So I defer to you in this case. Take it away. Now, Sandra is a factory worker who is on leave from her job, and in her absence, her co-workers have been given the option to either take a major bonus or let her keep her job. And she has just one weekend to try to convince them not to take the bonus. Our first image is of Sandra sleeping what I instantly recognized as the sleep of depression. It's the middle of the day, you have your clothes on, and you're dead to the world. Now I recognize this because this has been something that's been in my life for many years. I think at this point, realistically, three decades probably. Really as long as I can remember. Once I hit a certain age, corresponding with kind of late puberty, I started to notice that I seemed to feel and react differently than other people. And when I was in my late teens, it became much more apparent and got worse from there. Now, I've had many, many years in between bouts of depression that were depression-free and really wonderful. And yet, it's like an old friend or an enemy that sometimes chooses to revisit. Is it something that you feel like you always have to be wary of? Or are these times in between, are you not thinking about it very much? You know, I think it's gone both ways. I feel like whenever it's come back, I look back on those previous times as I was fooling myself that it would never come back again. That's super interesting because that also plays into some of the observations that I have about the film in terms of being able to assess things accurately when you are within or without that particular set of circumstances. And the other part of that is the times that are depression-free feel very real. I don't feel in the moment that I'm living in a fantasy world and I'm just beating back this thing, but I know when it's coming back. And the other part of this opening image that feels so familiar, I can also see the difference that being on medication makes. 
which also contributes to that level of sleep. Now, the thing that rouses Sandra here is the phone ringing and her pie is ready downstairs. And the phone is ringing with the news, just like that. The economy of what the Dardans do is to create our incident in the very first moment as we're learning who Sandra is. She gets the news that this choice has been provided to her fellow co-workers. And yet there's a chance. And as we watch her trying to get the meds inside her right now, and we see her husband, Manu, I'm thinking about what's going through his mind as he comes upon this closed door because he's also getting this news. And that closed door is not something he is encountering for the very first time. It's a clear signal. He understands what this means. What do you think is going through his mind? Do you think there's that moment of fear of what could be happening on the other side? It not being a good thing. It could be some very dire piece of self-harm. And or do you think he's thinking about what his job has to be? I think this movie hits home for both of us for these very specific reasons. I think we are very much these characters at certain times in our lives. And so, yes, it's a terrifying thing to be standing on the other side of that door. I don't want to compare the two, but there is a lot that goes into being the person in the equation that is not the depressed person as well. And I can't even imagine what it must be like in the case of this character who also has to manage the children. You dread what you might find on the other side of that door this time. If that's okay, then you know you have to be encouraging, but how much do you push? There's an awful lot to take in, and they do such an incredible job communicating that, both the Dardans in their writing and these performers. Because, like you mentioned, there's a true economy in the stuff that they do, the little details, the day-to-day. For instance, this thing that she's cooking, this pie in the opening scene, that's for the children. That may not seem like very much, but in your case, and in my case, having been through it on my side, it becomes very significant in that it's something that gets you up. It's your reason to get out of bed. It's your reason to keep going when nothing else is doing that for you. I completely agree. It feels like that instance of, I'm home, I have to do something to show my worth, even for a moment. I have to somehow be the mother as well, and so this is the thing that I can do, and then mark off my list. And as fluidly as Marianne Cotillard can convey all of this, and as much as she is this film, it would be nothing without Fabrizio Rongione's performance and the character of Manu. I think of them as a unit in this. Yes, it makes his performance that much more impressive to adequately communicate the partnership because at so many instances, she is fighting against the very existence of that partnership. Her depression is constantly working to undermine not only her, but them. Because there's something very real that happens to a lot of people, which is that the depression and the meds themselves can completely undercut your libido, your drive in general, as it's working to try to actually keep you alive. And so all of these things that you're asked to do in your life, all of these roles that you need to play, become the things that undermine your own existence. The thing that she does so brilliantly for me in this opening sequence is knowing that and putting that idea across, but also projecting how much that character knows They have to exhibit stability. They have to encourage confidence in their co-workers. They have to encourage confidence in their partner. Even if they feel nothing like it. Mustn't cry, she tells herself. Not only for what it looks like to everyone else that might be observing her, but if it begins, she can't stop it. It will be her undoing if she allows it even that much of a foothold. So her self-awareness and her self-assessment is accurate in that regard. It's not so out of control that she doesn't know what she needs to do at this point to keep it together, at least momentarily. But it goes so wildly in and out of that, which I can only assume is accurate based on how you respond to it, based upon other things I've read by people who suffer the same way. This is a hard one for me to empathize with. At one point she says to him, that's easy for you to say. And I think to myself, yes, it is. It is very easy for me to say. And in this case, in this situation, that has benefits and that has drawbacks, both. The benefit is that it is easy for me to pick up and keep going. 
and therefore provide the stability you can't provide for yourself in this situation. But it also makes what you're going through so foreign to me because I literally have no experience with this. Is it safe to say that you've never felt a depression? Or am I putting words in your mouth? Because I've lived with you for a while now, and I've seen you go through really difficult times and difficult moods, but I'm not inside your head. I don't know how it feels, and I don't know what you're telling yourself. I might have gone through it. I've certainly experienced things even to the point of considering not being here anymore. I think most people have experienced that to one degree or another. The significant difference in my case is how I then respond to that feeling inside myself. And it is in direct opposition to a lot of the things that I made note of that we'll talk about as the scenes unfold. The most obvious difference being all of the issues surrounding self-worth, the thing you mentioned. I don't know if it's because I overestimate my worth when it comes to that sort of thing, or I'm just so stubborn that when anything, even my own brain tells me, you can't do this, I am going to fight back and say, I can do that ten times over. I don't find it debilitating. It doesn't make me want to quit. It makes me want to fight. Speaking as a lay person here, tell me how you feel about what I'm about to say. I think of the idea of situational depression versus what starts for me to feel like a chemical issue, mm. that my brain is getting rewired. You mean in the sense of what I'm describing that I'm going through? I would say that's probably exactly right. Mine is specific to certain circumstances. It's not something I carry around all the time. It's not something I have to be worried about periodically cycling back around. It is very much dependent on how severe the thing is that is happening to me externally. And almost always, I feel like I will defeat this thing. And I don't mean to suggest that one, for some reason, has more weight than right. the other. Absolutely not. But you characterize it exactly right in terms of the differences between what we go through, you and I, I think. And I think also that comes back to the beauty of this film. We've covered minutes. <laughs> right. And yet I feel like I know these characters, whether that's because I do know these characters internally or and it's because they're doing such an amazing job. It's just so well written, I think. I don't know if either one of the Dardans struggle with this themselves, but it certainly seems like it's written by someone who has experienced this firsthand. It's not the first time it shows up in their work, either. Something that you've mentioned in relation to other films is not what I would call depression tourism, for mm -hmm. sure. And we move into this next section, which is about Manu really trying to get Sandra to rally and to go do this next thing, which is to meet with her boss, who is going to possibly give her a chance. And we see that there's this tenuous hope. And for me, that is the most terrible feeling in the world. I would rather there be no chance than a chance that I put myself out there again, or do something, or struggle through all these things, and do something that might hurt me even more, only to ultimately come out the loser. So I think that the stakes here are very real and very dire, because what if she goes through all of this and still does not get to keep her job? That's interesting, because coming from my side of it, my initial reaction is, so what? But again, that's one of those situations that's easy for me to say. Not only because I don't struggle with depression regularly, but also because in this case, I'm not exactly tuned in to what the Belgian job market is like, what that economy is like, because they appear to be, if this were an American film, upper middle class in terms of their education. They seem to be very educated people, perhaps that class that would have been overqualified in the economic collapse here in 2008. But just in terms of their employable qualities, it seems to me, on the surface level, it would not be hard for either one of them to get a job somewhere. But circumstances in Belgium are different than that. Now, let me first put that in context in the world of this film. And Manu states very clearly that we have to have your salary as well. Otherwise, essentially, we go back to public housing. But when I heard him say that, again, the first thing I thought was, eh, not ideal, but manageable. You were there once before. He says, go back to. If you did it before, you can do it again. It's not ruin. It's downward mobility which isn't pleasant, especially when the sting comes from, in her case, feeling responsible for that. But it is not the end of the world. 
Lots of people have gone through it and rebounded. I think in one instance, it's that sense of having no bounce left in you that depression can give you. And so now to get into a little bit of the statistical issues. To give you a bit of an idea of the world in 2014 and now, so you can see small changes or no changes, if we look at the unemployment rate in 2014, in the U.S., it was between 5 and 6% for that year. In France, it was a whopping 10%. In Belgium, 8.5%. So that's massive. That's higher than it's been in the U.S. in a very long time. So something that's difficult, I think, for both of us to relate mm -hmm. to during our career lifetime, for sure. And then comparatively in Germany, 5%. So Germany and U.S. running around the same. Western Europe, France and Belgium, much, much higher. I want to compare that to right now, this year, 2017. In Belgium, it's still at 7.7%. .7%, so it's better, but it's not great. Germany's way down 3.7%. And then again, France, very high, 9.5%. And in the U.S., we're down to 4%. So it's no accident in these conditions that seem to be sustaining themselves in these areas that the Dardans have taken on this struggle of the working class as far back as when they were making documentaries, way before they even started feature films. But it's always been a focus of theirs. I read a really terrific interview with them, and I'm going to link it into our show post as well. But they talk about how work is enabling a body to live. Is there any wonder why I love these guys so much? They also talk about how one of the great wishes of humankind is to transform things. And an aim of humankind, whether you're a man or a woman, is to change things. And so that focus on how you can become so marginalized when you do not have a job, when your job is a struggle, and the true dignity that does come from doing something, and deriving a sense of being useful through the work that you do. And in this sense of this film, you are truly affecting your family's life if you do not have a job. So again, there's a very real possibility that she might not be able to find something, at the very least, quickly. And they are not working at particularly very highly technically skilled jobs. Though, of course, hers does. She does work at the solar panel factory. He is working a restaurant job, which some context clues for me indicate that it's a fairly new job for him as well. It doesn't seem like he's been there for a very, very, very long time or necessarily that it's a calling in particular. So we have people who are working to keep food on the table, keep the lights on, and when you don't have that, that's an incredible psychic impact. Well, you mentioned the Dardans talking about the value in enacting a change. The change that she needs to enact in this case is to make sure that she still has a job to go back to. And I realize in retrospect now, after watching this quite a few times, this is a quest. This is her odyssey. And even though it's treated in that beautiful Dardan style with the handheld camera and the natural lighting and the almost documentary approach, it is truly epic issues. It is life and death. It's just tucked into a very intimate story. They're so good at smuggling these huge themes in under the radar in these very poignant, closely observed, almost chamber pieces is what they feel like sometimes. But her quest is now to convince these people to give up their bonus, which will financially make room for her on the work roster. And so what we have from here on are the visits that she makes, the range of responses that she receives, and how much each one of those is encouraging or discouraging and why. And it's a terrible bargain that's been put to her by her boss. It is clearly stated, these people get their bonuses or you get your job. We will not do both. And through all of this, we have to watch her wait and listen and take this in and try to breathe. What's most fascinating to me is to watch this evolution during these visits. It starts with, I'm going to just ask the question, not even ask, just sort of restate the problem and wait. I'm not going to beg and I'm going to try to keep it together while I state this. It then turns into something really fascinating when you see her start to move her body forward even a little bit and get closer. And the question becomes, 
why is your bonus more important than the money that I would get as well? When she actively starts to put herself in their minds as a human being, active in this equation. This was the first major instance that I feel like that I was really aware of the difference in how I would react versus her or you. It starts off sort of easy for her, relatively. She does the first one over the phone, and that one is actually a friend of hers. And so they acquiesce to her, not begging like you said, but they tell her, I'm on your side in this case. The second one is where the difference kicks in. When she has to go see someone in person, it really underlines that everyone has their struggle. Kids' tuition, jobs are scarce, like you mentioned. And that encounter would have been the biggest setback for me. When I have to look someone in the eye and we're on even footing, they make a very logical, reasonable argument for why they can't do this. That, to me, is much harder than dealing with someone who is angry or dismissive. But in her case, it's harder for her when she's treated like nothing, not when she's treated as an equal like this. She has a harder time with the situations in which she is ignored. It seems like that to her is a direct attack on her worth and value. It's where I diverge from understanding her viewpoint a little bit. For me, it would be much harder to appeal to someone who just reasonably says, we're all sort of dealing with the same struggle, rather than the person who won't even buzz me in to talk to them. I do think that that is cumulative, and I think that we see the change happen. Let me go back a bit. Let's get into some of these, if that's okay. okay. So in the first place, she does already have a couple of people on her side, which is very buoying for her. She's got her friend Juliet, who has been trying all the time to get phone numbers for her, addresses. Manu is on her side as well, also doing this. Her kids are even pitching in. I love the Juliet character as well, because much like Manu, the situation is, how much do I push? And in her situation, she's not even got skin in the game exactly, except this is my friend and I love her. How much do you fight for someone who will not fight for themselves? And Juliet is really actively working at this. She's trying to lay the groundwork all over the place and do as much as she can. And so, again, I think about all of these shortcuts that happen, things that we're not told. We're not told how long they've worked together or everybody's backstory, and yet it's conveyed to us. The important part of that, I think, being they don't necessarily tell us right up front that the reason that she was out of work in the first place had to do with her mental state. And further to that, we don't know what triggered that mental state. Was she attacked? Has she always been depressed? Was there some sort of medication issue? Did she have a miscarriage? Who knows? It's completely left up to our imagination. But what I appreciate so much, again with the Juliet character, and as we see in certain interactions, and again like you mentioned, the thing that bothers her so much is when someone she has worked with for a long period of time will not even speak to her. This movie exists in the world that I exist in, which is that We are human beings, and we face each other every day. And to then treat someone who has stood beside you, worked with you, completed projects with you, maybe shared secrets or intimate personal details about your own struggles, will then not treat you as the human being you know you are? That's incredibly devastating. And with that first call that she makes that you mentioned, She really can't even put into words the request that she has or why she's making it. And I imagine if that person on the phone had said no, if her first attempt was a no, I don't think she could have continued. But it's a yes, and that's at least enough to try to get to the next person. And now here we have the instance that you had mentioned when we meet the husband, her co-worker. We also meet his wife. And they have very real concerns about children in school, have to pay for tuition, he has to do work under the table just to keep bills paid, and he clearly says, I didn't vote against you, I voted for a bonus. And that becomes an easy decision to make when you depersonalize everything. Sorry, not easy decision to make, easier decision to make. I love his wife in this scene, speaking of the little things that the Dardans do that very subtly communicate all sorts of things. When Sandra comes to the door first, there's some trepidation, and it is clear to me, at least in my imagination, that she and her husband have discussed this already. 
This is not entirely a surprise. And there's a fear in her face that indicates to me that it's not entirely set. She's not entirely confident of what her husband's answer might be. Especially if you have to give that answer to the face of the person that it's affecting. None of that is verbalized. All of that happens in the blink of an eye, an expression passing across the face, but it's so beautifully done. And also in that purely human way, even though they both explain why he is voting against her, and may again when this revote comes up on Monday, she still offers Sandra something to drink. And they still give her the address of the next person to try to go see. The next two are definitely a setback. We have Mireille, who says that she has left her husband and is starting a new life and really needs this money to basically create a new household and asks her not to be angry with her for that choice. And then Nadine, who is the person who will not even answer. She has her daughter pretend that she's not at home, which is the thing that really undercuts her. See, me being me, that infuriates me and fuels me to the next stop. That doesn't make me want to quit. I would be much more discouraged by the feeling that these are fair and decent people and I have no right to ask this. Once you completely shut me out and don't give me the opportunity, now I will just redouble my efforts. I think also there's a really smart decision here. When you're in that kind of situation... What is happening physically inside you definitely makes a difference. And so they make the really smart choice to have her need to get some food right now. (laughs) Not everyone could be simply fueled by hate and anger as I could be in that situation. Yeah, some of us need to, when we get our sinking spells, we need to get our Mr. Cookie Bar inside of us. And it is important. I think that that's a really good point. She cannot, she's running on fumes. So you got to put something inside you right now, try to regroup and go again, which is what Manu and her family are there for. And I want to say all this time, we constantly see her retaking her meds, re-upping. And what we later learn is Xanax. We don't know what it is at the beginning. Now we have, I think, the first of my three favorite interactions, and this is with Timur. Me too. I love this character so much, and their interactions specifically. And also, Timur is one of the faces we see several others of what the immigrant working class looks like as well. No coincidence, I'm sure, based on the Dardan's progressive outlook that the multicultural team are the ones who come to her defense vote in her favor for the most part. As much as I am ignorant of the economic conditions in Belgium, I also could probably stand to do a little bit more research about racial divides. But I am sure, based upon how honest they are about everything else, that this is also not a set of circumstances that is uncommon in the Belgian workplace. She goes to find Timur while he is coaching soccer. And he comes to her. He looks so emotional, my heart starts to break at this point. And I don't know what he's going to say, and he completely surprises me. His shame is palpable, and he completely restores our faith when it feels like all hope may be gone, depending on how this interaction goes. He is practically overjoyed and filled with gratitude that she has come to ask him this because he felt so guilty and ashamed for voting against her, especially when he talks about something good that she had done for him. And this is when I want to talk about labor. I think we had a bit of this discussion during the blue collar episode, but what infuriates me about this, and it's when it occurred to me during this specific interaction, is this crappy, false choice or lack thereof that has been created by management. And when you said earlier that feeling of, I have no right to ask this, it's because she's been set up to feel that. But instead management has created this idea that there are only two choices, you or this money. And so therein, they set about destroying everyone based on however they decide to vote. And so just like in Blue Collar, I feel like they pit us against each other. It's my first favorite scene because of the redemption. He gets a chance to put this thing right and repay a kindness that she gave him who knows how long ago. In addition to being impeccably played, The Dardans are such experts at perfectly casting a film 
Every one of these interactions is very small. The roles are not huge roles. There's only a handful of lines for each one of these people. But this is the first instance I really get the feeling that it's not overplayed. It's not exaggerated, but he has made the most of this opportunity. In a very small amount of time, he makes a huge impact. Are there other things about it that make it your first favorite scene? Am I missing something? It inspires a smile from her, which we only see in very fleeting moments in this film. The emotion is so open on his face, it makes me want to weep with him. And now Timur is going to call Miguel for her as well, which is really kind of him to do. She's next on to Hisham, and I love this moment as well because she first meets his wife because he is working, which his wife can't reveal at the time. There are a number of these interactions that happen through filters at first. She often has to go through a wife, through a daughter, in one case, sort of circumnavigate a slightly abusive husband. Why do you think the Dardans wrote that in, rather than having her encounter everyone directly, immediately? I think there are realities at work here. One with Hisham is that he also has to work under the table. He cannot reveal that he has the second job. And it gives him the opportunity also to show those different family dynamics at a human level, the wife and husband switch to their own language so that they won't have to say necessarily to her face, this is what she's asking. No, I cannot possibly do this. And also, if you called me right now, I wouldn't answer. If somebody came to the door, I wouldn't necessarily answer. I'm not always home. And so it would be overly convenient for her to get the person on the first try every time. In a moment, we understand what his life is. A very, very young baby more than one child, they live in what I would consider to be probably a more typical public housing situation as well. So it's an opportunity for her to go back to what she may have already been through and doesn't necessarily want to go back to right now. But in this instance, again, the practical realities of Hisham's life is that he can't say yes. His family needs that money. Now, though, she starts to become more insistent about her rights as well. And again, that sense of labor, she finds out that her supervisor has been calling around, especially to the most vulnerable people. In this case, the most vulnerable being the immigrant families and the people who are at the lowest rung of the lower class. And the people with, maybe because of that, have more children, a larger family. They are a little bit older as well, so you have less opportunity to jump to something else. And just because I think also Jean-Marc, the supervisor, has a cruel bent, it wouldn't occur to everybody in that position to call around and try to do this, but he does. And this is a setback. Both Hisham's response and learning about what Jean-Marc is doing in the background. Again, another variation on the theme that she is not valued, and therefore that is a larger struggle. And so it now falls to Manu to instill in her again that that is not correct, that she is valued, that there are people on the team that will fight for her, that she is worthy of love and support, a speech that he's had to give a number of times, I'm sure. So they take a brief ice cream break, and he delivers this pep talk. And again, I'm finding myself struggling as a viewer, generating empathy. It's hard, and sometimes it makes me angry, because I know what he is going through sitting there doing this. He has to be a cheerleader, and in the case of some of the things that he is saying, I know that he can only half believe it. How do you have faith, as he says that he does, when she talks about how you don't love me, you just pity me, we haven't had sex in four months, and he says, but I know we will again, which is indicative of a broader sense of faith. How do you continue to have that faith? Do you just have to tell yourself that? Do you, do you just have to say it until it becomes the truth? Or until it becomes no longer true and you have to say something else? I don't know. That's a question for you. Putting myself in his shoes, I have to remember, right now, her perceptions of all of this cannot necessarily be trusted. And that's with all kinds of things. How her co-workers regard her, how he regards her. She's at a very low ebb. And everything, her interpretation of these things at least, is clouded and poisoned by her depression. In her case, I think it's more to do with saying it until it becomes true. Telling everyone that she's better. Telling everyone that she's stronger. She knows that's not true. 
as much of the medication as she's taking, as much as she's wildly fluctuating between this is going great or I want to quit, she knows she is not that much better. She has to project that image, certainly, or there is no point in having these conversations with everyone. But in his case, I said half believe. I think it's more than half. It's enough that he can hang his hopes on it. His perceptions are not skewed by this, and so he has to be strong enough to carry both of them over this spot. And I think he really does believe, when it comes down to it, if I have to choose one or the other, he thinks that it will be better. I think he has faith. It's the difference between being depressed and thinking, I will never feel better again, and having the realization that I've been through difficult times and I got through them, and there is an end in sight. And now next, we have one of the most difficult interactions, the one I was sort of waiting for, because I do feel like I mentioned management is pitting people against each other, and you are creating a situation that could go into violent territory, and it does. She next goes to Yvonne and his son, who both work there with her, and they're working on some cars. And the son is incredibly combative, and it gets violent very quickly. He goes to shove her, to attack her, and instead hits his father, knocking him out for a brief period of time. And if they were both not on her side to begin with, because of this, Yvonne says, you can count on me. That is no insignificant thing to side against a family. Because these are truly mostly decent people that she is dealing with. Absolutely. And if nothing else, again, they're human beings. They're not extraordinarily terrible or extraordinarily saintly or anything like that. It's just regular people making decisions for their daily lives. After this encounter, this is when I feel like she does start to get a little bit of your anger. She talks about, I feel like hitting them too. And asks the very real question, how will I deal with these people all day if I go back and they don't have their bonus? If this was just a taste of what I might be in for. But again, it is onward. And so next, she's going up this large hill into this area of what I think of as new modern construction. And this is her coworker An, who has just bought this house with her husband. They're putting it together. And she says that Basically, he won't let her, really, in effect, because they need this money for a new patio, a new wall, which sound, among all of these interactions, the most kind of frivolous. But again, she's not talking about buying a tiara for herself. This is, you know, real life. And they've certainly earned it. It's no one's right to ask them not to have a thing that they have put their time in for. So it's a no, but it's a tentative no. And in the meantime, we have... One of these instances of only two that I can think of, of music in the film. The Dardens typically do not score their films, is that right? Yes, at least not in the sense that you think of a film being scored. It's typically diegetic music. And here, it's the French version of Needles and Pens. It's Petula Clark. And instead of Needles and Pens, it's translated in the French as The Night Never Ends. And now we have another really difficult one, and I was alluding to this one earlier, when I see her physically start to change. And this is Julien, and he's more demanding. He wants to know who else has said yes. This is the first time that she does not give that information. Is that a wise decision on her part, do you feel like? I think so, and I think it's because she can sense that this is different, and I also think that she is starting to stand up for herself. He also tells her, Flat out, 16 of us can do this job, so why should you come back? Bam. Right in the self-worth. This is the hardest one to deal with, I think. This question that's rooted in, we don't need you. No one needs you. And with that, Sandra goes back to see Anne, and clearly there's an argument taking place. She's still talking to her husband. He physically jerks her back inside. One thing I forgot to mention in their first interaction, when she's having this conversation with Ahn the first time, the Dardans don't do big, splashy, expressive staging a lot of the time. Everything they do is so subtle and clever. The very first interaction she has with Ahn, they're standing at the corner of the house, acting as a clear dividing line between the two for one thing, but subtly indicating just how pivotal this interaction is for both of them. Both of them, because of this conversation, are about to turn a significant corner in their lives. And it is a big turning point because we are back home and 
The moment that I saw Sandra cleaning up her kid's room, tidying, I knew what was going to happen next. I wondered about that. It took me probably two viewings. I already, Since I knew what was coming this time, I got it. In retrospect, I wondered if that was a signal to you and to anyone else who might have had similar struggles. You knew what that was supposed to be. She deflects here. She says, I'm going to go do this other thing. I'm going to pick up food for the kid's picnic tomorrow, which makes you think that she's thinking ahead to the future. But I knew that she was about to commit suicide or at least try to. Speaking of the things you see in retrospect and the subtle things that the Dardans do, I didn't catch that the first time. In this viewing, I actually caught it even earlier than this. They're in the car, and she says, put her on the phone, in reference to her daughter. That's when I knew this time. Great point. But this is fueled by the fact that she's defeated. She feels like this is not going to succeed, but even more so, what do you think it was about that confrontation with the husband, the fact that she doesn't want to sow discord, and the ironic thing that comes along with the depression and suicide. She seems to be so concerned about how she's affecting other families, but it does not allow her to think clearly about what this is going to do to her own family. The quote-unquote clear thinking is that Manu is the safe one. He will be able to take care of the kids. They will be better off without me. Always. The world... My husband, anybody, is better off without me. But she's hitting bottom here. Even though she's clearly not been healthy since the very first frame, this is the lowest point of several low points. And then those two turning points collide, like you mentioned. As she has ingested all of these pills, someone is downstairs. It's An who has come to say, I'm going to vote for you, and I've left my husband. And that's when she has to say, I just took the whole box of Xanax. This is an incredibly tough scene, I feel like. That look on her face, having to admit this thing that she has done. Maybe even harder to do in front of a relative stranger rather than to her husband. What do you think? Which part of it was the most difficult part for her? I feel so many different things. I feel the difficulty in, God damn it, I had this plan and now I can't Mm. do my plan. Mm -hmm. And also, someone else is now counting on me. Yet another person. And also, maybe it has changed, and so maybe I can get some help now. And the fact that you do have to ask for help when you've just made what should have been an irrevocable decision to never ask for help again. There's a lot, and it's not for me to say right here everything that also would have been playing across your mind of, I was just preparing to have my beloved find me dead without a word. But now that's not going to happen because they get her to the hospital. I love this hospital scene for a number of reasons. First, the doctor. Again, one of those incredibly pivotal but extremely small parts. As an audience member, he calms me immediately. All of this sense of turmoil that we were going through immediately evaporates as soon as he's on screen and lets us know that we're out of the woods. And I think it works so well because he does it in such a non-judgmental way, his bedside manner is impeccable. The other part of it, in terms of dealing empathically with these characters, I feel what Manu feels so acutely. I am so relieved and yet so simultaneously furious at where we are right now, and I am helpless to express some of that because support right here is so crucial. The person who is on the other side of that just has to swallow that. And I'm left thinking, how many times has she said, and will she still say, forgive me? Do you think it's important that she says it here? Do you even register it? I think it's utterly sincere, and I think it's very important that she says it. That does not take away from the fact that when I am giving that forgiveness, because I will, and I have to, that somewhere in the back of my head, I am wondering, when is this coming up again? Each one of these instances has to be taken completely individually. But it does have a cumulative effect, not only on the person who is depressed, but on the person who has to take care of them as well. But I believe her. I think right then, she thinks this is the last time. Do you think so? Does it feel like? That she won't be in that dire place again? I think she conveys that. I don't know if I believe it. But I think that she conveys that. Well, regardless, it's pretty galvanizing because she leaves the hospital and goes on to her next set of visits. Galvanizing not just for her, but I think for Ahn as well. We now get my second and third favorites. 
My second is the very, very brief interaction with this fellow young man who says, I'm the only breadwinner here. You are right to fight for this. It is disaster for me if they back you, but I hope that they do, as he's crying. And before we get to Alphonse, my last final favorite, we have that moment in the car, and Anne is talking about her motivations, making the decision to finally make some decisions on her own. And they have that second musical moment, this time with Gloria. And now we're at Alphonse. And like with so many of these other interactions, when she goes to his home, he's not there. It's answered by his sister and his mother. And they take her to the laundromat where Alphonse is doing the laundry. I love the wide range of experience and motivations that all of these characters have. Alphonse is primarily motivated by fear. His circumstances are quite different from almost everyone else's. But it's sort of the last tile in this mosaic of varying degrees of knowing what's right and doing what's right. Being able to unify thought, word, and deed, which is such an important thing to me in my life. Obviously, that is why I admire the characters the most that are able to do that, regardless of what it is that they have to fear or they have to lose. That's why these interactions are my favorite. And Alphonse's concerns are very real. He is on a short-term contract. And I'm not sure that in America we can understand quite as much. We definitely are in the age of the gig economy, for sure. But the use of the short-term contract is something that, to me, is quite European. And if you look at those sort of global business trends, by 2014, the use of temporary employment and part-time employment had increased by something like 10% across the board for all workers, and that's gigantic. If you look at 32% of all employee classes being temporary workers... A third? A, a third. It's, a, it's amazing. And so Alphonse has a right to be scared. He should be scared. And if somebody like Jean-Marc can put the screws to him and make him believe that his job is in jeopardy because of this, and even though he says that his God tells him to vote for her, he's afraid to. And again, this is how management gets you. You start with one Faustian bargain and you think, well, that's the only bargain I'll have to get through. And that is never the case. Because they start with one thing, and then nothing can be secure. So if you think that Sandra is the only person who's going to be in this situation, you're fooling yourself. But they have a lovely interchange here. And then, of course, it's the time. It's Monday. It's 8 a.m. It's time for the vote. And after some wrangling, Sandra and Jean-Marc have to wait out in the hallway so that the vote can take place. Juliette is the one who comes out to deliver the news. It's 8 to 8 which means there's no majority and she doesn't get to keep her job. The people who voted for her stayed behind and want to say goodbye to her, so we see who voted for her. Were there any surprises in that group to you, or did it play out exactly like you thought? I think it played out like I thought. How about for you? Same. Okay. Now, after she thanks everyone and she's in the process of cleaning out her locker, she does get word that her boss would like to see her. And then again, those same shitty bargains... He says, I will give them the bonus and I will take you back, but I am going to let a short-term worker, whom we know to be Alphonse, go at the end of his term. Having gone through all of this, it seems like she's learned an awful lot in a very short time. While the vote was going on, she has stood up to Jean-Marc. I wonder if that's the very first time she's ever spoken to him that way. I get the impression it probably is. She has been fortified by making it through this process. And now receiving what she wanted, at least most of what she wanted, she turns it down. She rewards our faith in her, paying back all of the things that everyone did to get her this opportunity again. It's a noble decision. And after having so many instances where I don't know that I can necessarily connect with what she's feeling and what drives her, I finally find myself on familiar ground with her. This is the decision that I would make, me too. Just like I hope every single person would make the decision to say we keep our workforce intact despite any of this money that can be thrown at us, which is just a blind, and to make the decision that what's right for one of us is right for all of us. And so she flat out refuses. She goes outside, calls Manu, and we have that 
really amazing moment of hope, I think at least. She's going to start looking for a job today. We put up a good fight. We did. And we see her smile one of those very few times. And as a parting shot, there's one last pang for me of, oh, if we ultimately came to this point, why did we have to go through all this? If you can recognize now that it's going to be okay, you lost your job, which is what we were afraid of all the time, why this odyssey? She just made the admirable, noble decision. Are they trying to tell us that this journey was somehow necessary? It has to be, right? It does, and I'm going to quibble with you just a little bit. Okay. The news about losing her job was a surprise. I mean, that came, at least to her and to us, out of the blue. It was then followed up by, okay, well, wait a minute, maybe there's something we can do. And then she's got to marshal all of her forces, when she doesn't have any of them to marshal, to try to make this thing happen. So yes, she does have to learn, because what's the point of any odyssey? Golden Fleece. So I think it's pretty remarkable that you get the rug pulled out from under you on Friday and you've got to get it all back together by Monday at 8 a.m. It's a heck of an odyssey. I think the valuable thing, the most valuable thing that you mentioned in that whole thing was the learning part of it. We go through this so that we're better equipped next time. Is that what we take away from it? She now has another experience, which she may or may not be able to call upon the next time, but it indicates to her, I am my own precedent. I've gone through this difficult thing. We've come out the other side. The lesson I've learned from this is that I am a survivor. I think that knowledge is crucial. And that is why we go through this story. And I think again about the we part. When we think back to something that she said, we haven't had sex in four months. So at least for four months, there's been this depression. And who knows if she felt like they were a unit for that four months. She certainly does now. And she says the we part. Now, is it okay for me to start wrapping us up a little bit? Sure, sure. I think we're there. I've asked the questions of you that I've won to throughout this episode, but I have one last question. How do you think, or do you think, your view of this film has changed because of me? I feel it significantly more deeply. I've never been in a relationship with a person before that has these struggles. So it hits home to me for sure. Even though I struggle with finding it sometimes, I am definitely much more sympathetic to her than I would have been prior to knowing you. I will admit, though, it's still tough sometimes for me to not think, get on with it. Which I know is not helpful to her, to you, to anyone that finds themselves at one of those very low points. There is no just get on with it. That feels utterly impossible, I know. It's made me more patient, although I don't know that that (laughs) exhibits itself entirely sometimes. It's made a huge difference, and I understand it in a way that I never could have before. Did we adequately cover why you've chosen and what it means to you? Hopefully I've blurted out enough (laughs) about and overshared enough to explain why this touches me so deeply beyond just being a spectacular film that I don't think you also have to have depression or suicidal depression to enjoy. Enjoy being a strange word. (laughs) Enjoy, yes. Enjoy there, but I do see what you mean. Okay, then we'll have our recommendations then. I couldn't quite find the right thing, and I'm also not allowed to recommend seasons one and two of Lady Dynamite. But you're sneaking it in there. I sure am. (laughs) So I've been trying to find a way to work this film in in general, so I thought, eh, why not? Because it does fit in an odd way. I can't wait to see what this is going to be. So from far left field, this is going to be Sweet Charity. (laughs) Okay. Tie this one together for me. First off, it's from 1969, directed by Bob Fosse, considered to be, at least by Austin Film Society, a dark musical. It's got Shirley MacLaine, Cheetah Rivera, Paula Kelly, John McMartin, and many other wonderful folks. I mean, I could go on about Stubby K and (laughs) Sammy Davis Jr. and Ricardo Montalban. I mean, it's got amazing people in it. This was more about watching someone face incredible disappointments and the worst near triumphs. And it also makes me feel better when I don't feel good. You've not seen it yet in its entirety, correct? No, I have not. Though I love Shirley MacLaine, so it's on the list to get to. You're a fan of Bob Fosse as well, right? Oh, definitely. Right? Yeah. Anyone that puts that much of themselves out there, that is that unfiltered in their creativity, I have a soft spot for no matter how that works itself out. Well, I think this is an interesting spectacle in that way. And it's all about Charity, who is a taxi dancer, 
who continues to have faith in the human race, despite apparently endless disappointments, to hope that one day she will find love. Spoiler alert, she doesn't. Hence the darkness, hence why I like it so much, and it's the choreography is beyond belief, as you can imagine. The music is wonderful. Shirley MacLaine is wonderful. Cheetah Rivera is wonderful. Polly Kelly is wonderful. It's not perfect, but it's dark and incredibly enjoyable. So I don't know that I tied that together, but who cares? So how about you? I'm going to stick with the Dardan brothers and recommend my favorite film of theirs, Rosetta from 1999. Even more than The Kid with a Bike? Even more, and I'll tell you why shortly. It's about a 17-year-old girl played by Emily Duquesne who lives in a trailer park with her alcoholic mother, and Rosetta is trying to impose some order on her life through work. You can see immediately why it probably appeals to me. Born and bred in Oklahoma, and I have never had a state motto be more appropriate feeling, I think, than this one. Labor omnia Vincent. Labor conquers all. This character, whether she knows that phrase or not, truly seems to believe in this idea that everything can be set right if she just works hard enough at it. I think the reason that I love it so much is because it values work the way the Dardan stuff always seems to. It has that immediacy of the Cassavetes and all of that stuff that I love so much. But that is amplified, I feel like, in such a great performance by the adolescence of the lead character. It has that handheld intimacy. It has all that turmoil, but that is turned up to 11 because of the point of this life that this person is in and the age they are. Everything is so raw and on the surface when you are 17 and you are dealing with things that even grown adults would have a hard time dealing with, the situations that she finds herself in. Tangentially connected to Two Days, One Night, there's also a suicide attempt near the end. I think it's the most raw and vulnerable and direct distillation of what the Dardans do so well that I love so much. They clearly become more polished as they go, as people who are actually practicing a craft often do. And these more current films don't lose anything because of that, but I really do favor this one because it feels like it is a shot straight into your heart. While there is nothing fancy about their current output, this is even more unadorned, and there are fewer things between you and just the raw emotion of it. I'm really interested to see how they continue to look at these women and men in these roles of caregivers and how incredibly difficult that is. And I know we've got the latest one on the way. Yes, I'm excited about that one. It's the only of their feature films that I haven't seen since La Promesse. But oddly, it seems to me in the description to be more of a procedural as much as anything else in their own unique Dardan way. It's the unknown girl, right? Right. Should be here this week. Okay. Well, regardless of that, we've got two great recommendations, as usual, Sweet Charity and Rosetta. And that brings us to the end of episode 63. If you haven't taken a look at our Patreon, we would certainly appreciate it if you would do that. That's at patreon.com slash magiclantern. There are all sorts of perks at all sorts of levels. Any support you give us is definitely appreciated. We've definitely lightened it up over there. We had some (laughs) really fun episodes. Right. And we've got two really neat ones coming up over the garden wall. And I think I might do a holiday favorite. I'm not going to say which one. Yes, fun stuff happening at the Patreon. If you would like to just get in touch with us, you could reach us at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast in any of those venues. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Drew Tavendale and our other brethren over at Fuds on Film, Andy Wolverton, Jeff Duncanson, Mike Scharf, Eric Parkinson at the podcast This Must Be the Place, Amit Medheshaya, one of the directors of The Cinema Travelers, who we did a Patreon bonus episode about, was kind enough to retweet our Patreon link. Yeah, I hope everybody goes to see The Cinema Travelers. If you get the chance, please go. And one last thank you. We had a new review come in on iTunes, a new five-star rating from JMP in La Jolla. Thank you very much for that. In addition to Apple Podcasts, we are also on Stitcher, Google Play, pretty much any podcatcher you use, you can find us there. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>